Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. This is Annie. And this is Gail. And this is Heroes. And Zero. The True Crime Podcast. We know it. You know it. We all know it. I can't even hear my voice. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hey, guys. Well, I'm excited because we are here. Part two. Part two of uh, the most recent podcast we did. So last week we all heard about this awful man named James Wood, mm-hmm. and this and Annie was doing some of her research from this book called Eye of the Beast. Yeah, and so we'll put out that link to the book on Amazon and yep. the authors and all of that. And so, but it's been overwhelming, awful, great at true crime story. But at the end of the day, so let's see, this guy has a hard childhood. You know, he he, says, he has three kids, or three marriages, and from what I can tell, he has at least three children, children. Yeah. and um, two from one marriage, one from another. But he likes to be angry with women. And he's angry. He's very mm, yep. angry, and um, I didn't, I, I have to go back and ask those numbers, of. but he committed hundreds of armed rapes, or armed robberies. 185. 185 armed robberies. 85 rapes. 85 rapes. Dozen of murders and dozens of murders so yep. this is really an awful guy it and um, so where we had just left off he likes to be a patron of the pizza hut the local pizza oh, hut right. in pocatello idaho and this is where he meets his next victim that's right her name we're gonna jump right in right yeah take her it name away. is beth ann edwards she was a pretty brown-haired teenager she had two younger brothers and a baby sister, and they were all having lunch at this very same pizza hut on Yellowstone Avenue after a morning of Christmas shopping. Having just obtaining her driver's license, Beth decides that she's going to drive. She asks her mother to let her warm up their vehicle after they get done eating lunch at the pizza hut. But the mom tells her, you know what, honey, why don't you first take your baby sister out there to the car with you, and then so Beth decides she's going to start the car, drive it around to the front to pick up her brother and sister. Beth's mother and brothers, they wait at the front entrance. And they wait, and they wait. There's no sign of Beth. Where is she? Impatient, irritated. Beth's mother decides, okay, one of us have to go looking for her. So she tells her oldest son to run around to the other side of the building to see what's taking his sister so long. He dashes out into the cold, and he returns with a puzzled look on his face. He says, there's no car, Mom. No one is there. No Beth and no baby sister. Oh, no. Yeah, can you imagine? On Tuesday, December 2nd, 1992, Detective Scott Shaw, do you recognize his name? He's one of the authors of this book. Detective Scott Shaw sits at his desk going over weekend reports. According to Mark Heideman, who is a Bannock County prosecutor, he says that this Scott Shaw is an interesting study in a law enforcement officer. He has a mentality that allows him to relate to criminals and to understand what they're saying and what they're thinking. Criminals, for whatever reason, especially sociopaths, they feel some sort of camaraderie with Shaw. He doesn't know why, but it's true. 39-year-old Detective Scott Shaw can get confessions and statements on cases that no other cop could. His intense interest in criminal profiling involving sexual offenders will prove to be Jim Wood's undoing. Oh, good. He's a hero. Yes, he is. He is the hero, I believe, of this story. As Detective Shaw, our hero, looks over the weekend reports, one catches his eye. The report was written, quote, This report was taken on Saturday, November 28th at 4.03 p.m. An officer was dispatched to a location on a report of an abduction where a handgun was used. Upon my arrival, I contacted Elaine Edwards, who advised me that her daughter, Beth, had been abducted from the parking lot at the Pizza Hut restaurant on Yellowstone Avenue. At this time, I requested that the victim, Beth, be brought to the Pocatello Police Department for an interview. Here is a summation of what he read. 15-year-old Beth took her baby sister out the door of the Pizza Hut to their car to start it and warm it up for her mother and her brothers. While leaning into the car to buckle her baby sister, a man came to the open door. He shoved a shiny silver gun into her stomach and told her, scoot over, and to give him the car keys. He pushed his way in and started the car, and he drove off. As he drove, 
He told the frightened teenager that he had just robbed a jewelry store and he just needs her car. That story sounds familiar. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. I asked earlier, she had a baby in there, her little sister. Mm-hmm. How old's the baby? It doesn't say. Oh, okay. It really doesn't. Because you had said 15, so I was like, I wonder how old this baby is. And I, I, I think she's under two. Okay. Or All she right. has to be carried. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Nope, you're, you're good. As he drives, he told the frightened teenager that he just robbed the jewelry store and he just needs her car. He couldn't use his own car because there were just too many people gathered around it. She describes the man as an adult white male, approximately 38 years old, 5'9", five 5'10", five around 160 pounds. He had short brown hair, a goatee, and a mustache, which came down to the corners of his mouth. He wore jeans with a blue jean jacket that had a white fleece collar lining, but he wasn't wearing glasses. After driving around for what seemed an eternity, the young girl said that he drove into the foothills on the west side of town and turned into a little circle area. Here is where she gives a graphic account of what happened to her. So, if you don't want to listen, fast forward of its sexual nature. The suspect put his hands up under her bra and touches her breasts. He, uh, this is uncomfortable for me. He also. I think it's uncomfortable for everybody. For everyone. He also sucks on them and he wants her to perform oral sex on him. And he wants her to kiss his private part. So the suspect took off her pants and her underpants and then he rapes her. During the rape, she told the man that he was hurting her and he told her to shut up. And, in fact, she was bleeding from the trauma. When the suspect notices, he asks her if she was, quote-unquote, on the rag. Asshole. After he raped her, he escorted her out of, the ve- out of the vehicle and walked her up by some bushes. He told her to wait there for a few minutes, that he was going to just drive the car down the road, and he pointed to a blue house and said he was going to leave the car there for her. But the man was acting nervous, saying, no, I don't trust you. I don't want to do that. And that's what she said? That's what she said he was saying. Wait, he said that? I don't trust you? Uh-huh. He told her, I don't trust you. Yeah, yeah. So after he said, I'm going to leave the car and leave you here, yep. drive the car over here, yep. he then says, wait, I don't trust you. Right. Okay, so then what? She didn't know this, and apparently he shot the gun, and it jammed. She must not have heard the gun jam then he says fine no i don't trust i don't want to do that and then bang after he had her kneel on the ground but the gun didn't go off and he said it must have been her lucky day the gun jammed and the way his mind works is okay the gun jammed and there's a bunch of snow on the ground i'm going to try to get that bullet out of the gun and then shoot her and hopefully it's successful, but then I have to look in the snow for the bullet okay. casing. And his, his mind is just spinning, thinking of all the what ifs and what will happen. And it's in the middle of the daytime. People might hear it. Right. He tells her that we're going to go back to the car and, and they drove around. And he says, I don't think you should tell anyone. I don't think it would be a good idea to do, do you? So they came to an area near the Syringa School where he pulled over. He took Beth's gloves, wiped down the interior of the car with them, and then let Beth and her baby sister, Victoria, out. He told her that he would leave the car back at the Pizza Hut restaurant where he took her. Beth walked with her sister to the Pizza Hut where from there she telephoned her mother. Mm, Can you imagine that phone call and your walk? I think it was just a short distance to the Pizza Hut. Beth changed her clothes, but she did not bathe, so that's a good thing, and her mother immediately took her to the police station. Good girl. After giving the officer her account of what happened, Detective Robinson drove Beth and her mother to the Bannock Regional Medical Center, where they performed a rape kit. After taking vaginal and rectal swabs of this little 15-year-old girl and collecting pubic hairs, Great, I bet that was just fun for her, That he, but you have to do what you have to do. The detective drove her and her mother to the foothills on the west side of Pocatello to locate the area of the crime scene. I think we just had a case like this not too long ago where they took the young victim. It was the mm-hmm. um, kitschy man of two murders. Beth recounted that when they were driving, the man was weaving all over the road and was possibly intoxicated. The rest of the report consisted of evidence gathered by Detective Robinson, which at that point consisted only of clothing that Beth Edwards was wearing. 
It seemed to Shaw that the suspect wasn't familiar with the streets of Pocatello since he turned down two dead-end streets before finding the road that led to the foothills. Beth said that the man became very angry and agitated every time he realized he turned down, turned down a dead-end street. Shaw himself was familiar with the area where the rape occurred. So after posting an officer to secure that area, Detective Robinson drove Beth and her mother home, then returned to the crime scene. Evidence showed that the suspect left the car running during the rape, and the exhaust melted a small circle in the snow, turning it black. Oh, wow. Two sets of footprints were found in the snow. They led away from the car. One large pair followed slightly behind and to the right of a smaller pair. Then, in the snow, Robinson sees impressions of what would have been Beth's knees where he had ordered her to kneel. Then both sets of footprints led back to where the car was parked. Shaw continued reading over the report before placing it back on his desk. He then went down the hall to speak to Detective Robinson. Shaw asked him what he thought of the Edwards case. Robinson leaned back in his chair and said, Well, Scott, you know, I'm not sure what to make of it. And Shaw asked him, You think it's a false report? No, no, I'm not saying that. Well, what is it then? Because obviously something's bothering you. Robinson went on to tell Shaw that he knows something happened to her. The hospital treated her for vaginal trauma. He saw the footprints in the snow, just like she described it. But he went on to say that the girl showed absolutely zero emotion whatsoever. She just calmly sat there and answered every question given her. She didn't seem upset, mad. She was just very matter of fact. She's probably in shock. That would, you know, duh. That's... My thought. Robinson had worked on many sexual and physical abuse cases over the years, and he had interviewed more rape victims, young, old, every every age possible that he cared to remember. But never did not one show at least some sort of emotion or anger. During their conversation, Shaw learns that the suspect wiped down the interior of the car with the victim's gloves. Forensics, they found zero prints. During the rape, the suspect bumped his head on the rearview mirror and had to readjust it, but he must have remembered to wipe it clean, too. See, he's done this before. Shaw went back to his office and reread the report. He knew his office had a dangerous criminal on their hands. On at least two occasions during Beth's subduction and rape, the suspect says, I'm in control. Ooh. That is a significant clue to a profiler. Detective Shaw called Elaine Edwards at 8 p.m., Beth's mother, and had the two come back to the station so he could speak with Beth again and go over details of the case. Shaw was struck by how similar the mother and the daughter looked. The same fine brown hair, round faces, slim build, looking more like sisters than, than mother and daughter. But most importantly, how innocent and natural Beth appeared to him. She was wearing no makeup, dressed casually in jeans, She did not fit the mold of a typical high-risk rape victim in either appearance or dress. It also occurred to Scott that Beth was not much older than his own daughter. After introductions, Shaw asked to speak to Beth alone. Her mother agreed and stepped out and closed the door. The tape recorder was running. Beth declined to have a Coke or any sort of drink, stating that she was just okay. She sat very erect, hands folded in her lap. She appeared neither upset nor apprehensive. Detective Shaw explained to her that he was investigating these kinds of crimes or has investigated these kinds of crimes in the past and knows that what she's going through has to be rough. But she needs to be as frank and open and honest so that they can catch this man. Beth nods. Shaw told her not to be embarrassed. He's heard it all before and that he will not be embarrassed by anything that she says. So don't hold back anything. No detail is too small. The conversation started with how the man initially took control by shoving a gun in her stomach and demanding that she scoot over to let him in. She put her baby sister in her lap, and when she didn't start the car like he asked, he grabbed them out of her hands and started it himself. Beth went on to tell Detective Shaw how scared she was. She didn't scream or try to run away because she couldn't leave her baby sister in the car with this man. He asked for her name. Beth made one up and told him she lived on Buckskin Road. Smart girl. When they stopped just prior to the rape, the man told her to put her sleeping sister in the back seat, so she did. Then he told her to slide over and sit next to him, but she didn't. So he grabbed her by the hair and pulled her over. He made her sit on his lap. Nice. He forced his hands up and under her shirt, and she tried to move them. He told her to stop using her hands, so she did. And then what happens next? He told me to take off my pants. 
And did you? No, I didn't do anything. So he just pulled them off of me. He told me to lay back on the seat so my head was against the door. And then he took them off. Beth was speaking softly and her eyes appeared dull and expressionless. Shaw understood why Detective Robinson was troubled by her demeanor. Beth had barely moved her hands from her lap, and she talked in an even measured and monotone way. Her emotions seemed totally flat. Beth went on to explain, after Shaw asked her to, the exact details of the sexual acts that he forced onto her. So, trigger warning. He learned that he had prematurely ejaculated when he took off his shorts. Then he forced her to perform oral sex on him, and he kept saying things like, kiss it, and so on and so on. Then he raped her for about five minutes. Shaw went on to ask more questions. What tone of voice did he use? What was his attitude during intercourse? Did he ask you to say anything? Beth stated that he kept wanting her to kiss him on the mouth and that she'd better do it because he was in control. He asked her if she liked it and all the other disgusting things that you can only imagine. He said other vulgar things to her that I will not repeat. Just use your imaginations. Beth said that it seemed like he was trying to be nice to her sometimes. Then he would suddenly get so mad that she thought he was going to kill her. Jeepers. He didn't take anything from her in terms of jewelry, money, just her gloves. And Shaw asked her, how would you describe him? His personal hygiene, I mean. Was he neat and clean? What were his clothes like? He had on blue jeans and a jean jacket. They weren't new, but they seemed clean. And they looked like they had been even ironed. He, so he seemed really clean. All right, Beth, I want to go back to something that you told Detective Robinson. You said the man appeared to be intoxicated or acted like he had been drinking. Why did you think that? Did you smell alcohol on his breath? Beth explains that she smelled smoke on his breath, but not alcohol, but thought he had been drinking because he couldn't concentrate on the road. He would be okay for a while. They would kind of weave in and out of the lanes. He would then catch himself and would drive okay again. It was like he was dreaming, and then he would wake up and see where he was. Shaw summarized in his mind what took place. The suspect would weave in and out of the lanes, catch himself, then looking for a place to rape the girl, and when he finally did find a place and stop, he had experienced a premature ejaculation. So Shaw was almost certain that the suspect was fantasizing, probably, probably from the minute he abducted the teenager, or even before, of what he was going to do to the girl. Scott escorted the young girl back to her mother, gave them his card, and thanked them for coming in and for the useful information that Beth gave him. How hard that would have to be for a young girl. Cannot even imagine. He went back to his desk, sat down, thought to himself that the young girl was obviously traumatized, and she was dealing with her ordeal the only way she knew how. He was certain she was telling the truth. He was certain she was not his first victim also. Detective Shaw went over the details of the case. He had no doubt that the suspect was a control freak, a dangerous sociopath who would do anything to live out his fantasies. He most likely viewed the abduction and rape and that it was nothing more than a date that he had sex with. Shaw typed up his report and his profile of the suspect and sent it out the following morning to every police and law enforcement department in the nation with the hopes that someone somewhere would recognize his modus operandi. Within hours, Shaw received a teletype from the police department in Eugene, Oregon. It said that there had been a series of rapes that had taken place in Eugene involving a man who matched the description that Beth had given. Back at Dave Haggard's house, Dave called his good friend, Liz Smith, and told her she needed to come over and see his wall mural that, he, that his cousin, Jim, had painted. She would really love it. So Liz jumped in the car and drove to Haggard's home to see the mural. Haggard met Liz at the door and introduced her to his cousin Jim, who shook her hand. Then they stepped back so that Liz would have an unobstructed view of the mural. Liz Smith is someone that we're even mentioning her name because she plays pretty much an important part in his story. Okay. Uh, a huge mountain scene covered the entire wall. The colors were vivid and the details were precise of the painting. A placid lake lay in the foreground with reflected tall green trees. A snow-capped mountain peak towered in the background, resembling the granite peak of the nearby Teton Range. Impressed, Liz marveled at how gorgeous it was, while Jim stood quietly to the side, watching her admire his work. Gross. A few days later, Liz came back to Haggard's home and introduced Jim to her daughter, Tammy, and with her son-in-law, Martin, who were living with Liz at the time. Soon, Wood became friends with the women, but Martin didn't care for him. He felt that he was just too nice to be real. 
Yep. Probably, well, we know he was. Yeah, yeah, he was just faking it, and uh, some people figured that out about him. Often the three of them would get together at the pilot house, that restaurant that displayed his artwork, you know, his saws and stuff, or they would have poker parties at Liz's house on Main Street. He would even sometimes end up staying the night and would sleep on the sofa after one of Liz's parties. Networking through Tammy and Liz, Wood began to make friendships all around Pocatello, and it wouldn't be long before extended relatives on Wood's mother's side of the family would learn of his return to Idaho. Like most people who met James Wood, from all outward appearances, he was soft-spoken, polite, and friendly, and a very likable person. But what the small town didn't know is that Wood could never be a friend to them. He was not a likable person. He could only give the appearance of a friend just to give him enough time to take advantage of that person to get what he wanted. He behaved as a grateful newcomer to those that would display his paintings for some extra money. Wood did not pay his cousin rent, though, but he still did not make enough money to be satisfied. So he never paid his cousin Dave a dime for letting him live at his house. He got a job as a dishwasher at Tina's Oxbow Restaurant Inn, but then quit three weeks later. Next, he found work with a builder in in Pocatello, but walked off the job within the first two hours. Eventually, Wood's dark past would catch up to him. Rumors began to circulate among his extended family that Jim had served time in prison for cutting up two young girls and raping one of them. Though Jim freely admitted to spending time in Louisiana's prison, he rarely told the truth as to why he was really there. Soon after learning that his half-brother was back in Pocatello, Ernest Arnold, who was living in Texas, apparently they weren't very close, wrote several family members warning them about his fears of Jim and that if Wood stayed in Idaho long enough, his concerns would be proven right. Still, Dave Haggard never received a letter from Ernest. Imagine if he would have. Dang it. Two days after the abduction and the rape of Beth Edwards, an article appeared on an inside page of the Idaho State Journal under the headline, Man Abducts, Rapes Teen Saturday Afternoon. The article went on to read that police were searching for a white male, about 38 years of age, 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10 inches tall. He had short brown hair, a goatee, and a mustache. He was wearing blue jeans and a jeans-type jacket that had a white fleece collar. At the end of the article was a phone number of the Pocatello Police Department and a computerized composite sketch of the suspect. The story did not go unnoticed by James Wood's relatives and his new friends. Wood's friend Liz Smith noticed that after the article was published in the newspaper, her friend suddenly stopped wearing his favorite jean jacket with the white fleece lining. A day after the newspaper article came out, the Pocatello Police Department received an anonymous tip concerning a possible suspect in the rape case of Beth Edwards. The tip was passed on to Detective Shaw. The caller said that they should look into a James or a Jim Woods who had lived in Chubbuck, that he had done time for rape, and the sketch looked a lot like him. Erroneously, the caller added an S to the last name. Shaw ordered a computer record search for a man with that name name. Several men with the name turned up in Pocatello and in Chubbuck and all across Idaho. So Shaw gathered the photographs of all of those men with criminal backgrounds and took them to Beth Edwards. Beth carefully studied the photographs, but none matched her vivid recollection of the man who abducted and raped her. Furthermore, Wood had not registered the Ford Ranger that he was driving in Idaho, so a vehicle search in Idaho would have been fruitless. Because the caller refused to give a name or a phone number, Police were unable to contact him for additional information. Son of a gun. The season came and went in the small town of Pocatello, Idaho. Okay, I just have to say something. Okay, if someone gives you a name and they won't give you their phone number or anything, you follow it up, and when that doesn't turn up anything, maybe you should look at the information you were given. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, of course, yeah. But I just, I can't imagine... If only they would have said, okay, it's it, maybe it's not Woods. Let's type in Wood. Oh, well. It's the little details that make a big difference. Exactly. The seasons came and went in a small town of Pocatello, Idaho, and Beth Edwards, she settled into her new normal. She was not the same since her attack, nor will she ever be the same. When her memories would raise their ugly head, she would retreat into her art, just like What's-His-Face, 
sketches and watercolor paintings covered the walls of her small bedroom. Some were sweet and whimsical, and then some were not. As Beth Edwards sat at her mother's kitchen table, only a few miles away, her attacker sat at another kitchen table working on his paintings. Here's a word from our sponsor, and now back to the show. One bitterly cold March evening, Jim Wood stopped into one of his favorite eateries, the Subway Shop, on Yellowstone Avenue. He was the only customer, and he ordered a spicy Italian meatball sub to the only clerk on duty, Jason Hatt, an 18-year-old high school student. Jason turned his back to the counter to put the sandwich into the microwave. When he turned around, he froze. The man standing in front of him was pointing a silver semi-automatic directly at him and his left hand was finding was hiding the lower part of his face, much like a bandana. The man ordered Jason to open the cash register and give him all the bills. The man told him to not reach under the counter. Jason put the bills in a bag as instructed and slid the bag across the counter. The man took the money, then walked down to the end of the counter and ordered the boy to do the same. Kneel down on the floor, the man said, pointing with the muzzle of the gun. Shaking, the clerk did as he was told. Just stay there till I'm out, the gunman said. Then he disappeared into the cold darkness. A few seconds after Jason heard the door close, he cautiously rose to his feet and looked out into the amber-lit parking lot, but it was empty. He shakily dialed 911. Wow. Um, He's just brazen. He just will go anywhere, hurt anybody. When he got the money, um, the weirdness in me goes, did he get a sandwich too? <laughs> or did he leave that? I think he didn't. I don't think he got it either. He didn't. Okay. I know our audience was thinking the same thing. Did you get the food or not? <laughs> Since we're talking about pizza and now I Subway, know. we're probably all going to need lunch soon. Exactly. Officer Kay Lynn of the Pocatello Police Department arrived shortly after other officers had set up a perimeter in the area of the Subway shop. Details and a description were given to the were given to Officer Lynn, and then later Lynn's report would read: At no time did the suspect seem to be in a hurry or ever seemed nervous. He was almost polite. The suspect was in the store for probably no more than three minutes. The only other item Hat could remember was that the man used a normal tone of voice when ordering his sandwich and a slightly more quiet one during the robbery. Jason went to the station later that evening to work with a sketch artist, and by the next day, a sketch of a wide-faced man wearing a dark baseball cap appeared in the Idaho State Journal. wonder if the sketch looked like the one that Beth made. Maybe. We're going to find out. Jeff Underwood, a devout Mormon with a wife and six children, had been having a recurrent dream since he was a young man. He was having this dream before he married his wife, Joyce even, before the birth of their first child. His dream, or his nightmare rather, was that he was the father of a young girl. The child was missing, so he would go searching for her. It came to him that he should look near water. The water was a river a wide, dark, swiftly moving river. Near the river, he would find his daughter. He was too late. He was always too late. She was dead. When he saw what had happened to his daughter, the dream would end suddenly. In September 1992, 10-year-old Geraldine Underwood had a proposal for her mother. She and her brother, Jamin, decided that they wanted to have a paper route together. Joyce Underwood knew her daughter was independent and strong-minded. She knew Jamin was old enough to accept this responsibility, but Geralee, she still had to be reminded to do her homework. Geralee had other obligations as well to consider. She had dance lessons that she had begun since she was four years old, and now she was taking clogging lessons. <laughs> oh, fun. I, know, clog- I used to have clogs. I know. I did. I used to live in Pella even. So. Oh, really? So yeah, for our li- listeners, <laughs> there's, um, you know, many places throughout the, the, the United States have uh, tulip festivals, right? And Pella is a Dutch community here mm-hmm. in Iowa that has a beautiful tulip festival, along with Orange City, I think, also has a beautiful oh, tulip festival. Yep, up in um, northwest Iowa. And so... Yeah, so yeah. I can only, yeah, so, so when we say the clogging and the Dutch, because... Imagine those wooden shoes. Right, right, all over. My sister wore it. I thankfully, kind of thankfully, was supposed to be in one of the Pella parades where you're supposed to clog, and I was on a horse and with a boyfriend at the time, and I wasn't wearing shoes, I was just 
on the back and it spooked as we went into a, a field and it ran my leg against a barbed wire fence and ripped the skin and like a big big flap down to the bone and so I was on crutches so I didn't have to wear clogs and dance on the parade because I was just dreading that <laughs> you know I don't know why I had clogs but I remember I think somebody brought them to me as a gift and I just remember them being uncomfortable as hell so yeah whoever's dancing and walking in those are crazy just and know their feet are screwed up wooden shoes I'm sorry I know your feet aren't anyway solid I like just that. had to throw that in like I used to have clogs <laughs> Gerald Lee had other obligations as well to consider. She had dance lessons that she had started when she was four, like I said. She was taking clogging lessons, and she was also vice president of her student council at Indian Hills Elementary and president of her primary class at church. So she's a little go-getter. Yes, she is. After explaining to her mother that she wanted to earn her own money, the freckle-faced little girl with her round glasses that made her look extra serious said, yes, she was sure she wanted a paper route. The next day, Joyce drove Jara Lee to the Idaho State Journal building near Old Town Pocatello. After a brief interview with a circulation manager, Jara Lee and her mother filled out all the necessary paperwork and 10-year-old Jara Lee had a job. To top it off, Jara Lee was told that her own neighborhood was included in the route that was available. Now, her and her brother, Jamin, would never be more than 9 or 10 blocks away from home. And the printing plant would deliver the papers right to their front door. It's good to have a paper route. However, many, well, I don't know if many, I know there were two high profile cases as a little girl in Iowa that yeah. were paper routes that got yeah. kidnapped. So Yeah, well, because usually, you know, it's in the morning when it's Early. really dark. Mm -hmm. Jamin and Jara Lee started their new job a few days later, and soon the pair became a familiar sight along their routes. Jara Lee soon developed a reputation for always taking care to place her papers on her customers' front steps or porches instead of just, like, flinging them and sometimes they hit the ground or right. wherever. She uh, soon learned also that collecting the money from her customers was her favorite part of the job. They would often invite her in to talk to them and would serve her with refreshments. Just so you know, my favorite part of any job is also collecting the money. <laughs> <laughs> I think she liked the money, but she really liked talking with the people. And most importantly, was the elderly that she really, really enjoyed. The spring of 1992 found Jim Wood was making friends with a woman that he met, and her name was Brenda Davis. He met her by chance, but found that he really enjoyed her two children. Of course he did. Pretty 11-year-old Erica and her younger brother, who weren't, he's not even mentioned. His name isn't given. Wood convinced Brenda that her two kids would have a blast just riding four-wheelers at his place and that they could spend the night so as to get an early start the next morning. Wood drove the kids to his home, or his cousin's home, rather, and gave them each a separate bedroom upstairs, then retired downstairs to his own room. Later that night... I you, don't like this. You guessed it, folks. Wood made his way up to Erica's room. He gave a soft knock on her bedroom door, then quietly opened and closed it. He sat on the edge of the bed and whispered to Erica, scoot over. Erica did, as she, Erica did as she was told. She was 11. She felt him slide into the bed beside her and slip his hand near her hip. Suddenly, he pulled down her sweatpants and leaned over and kissed her on the bum. Stop that. No, she screams. Wood pulled back as Erica jumped out of bed and ran down the hallway to her brother's room, closing the door behind her, and she remained there for the rest of the night. The next morning, Wood was just friendly and cheerful, acting as if nothing had happened while they were in the kitchen. But Erica was quiet and withdrawn. At first, Jim would make each child ride on his lap around the yard. Then he showed them how to use the throttle and drive by themselves. They squealed with delight, taking turns, like racing all around the noisy four-wheeler all around the yard and into the pasture behind the house. The excitement of learning to drive the four-wheeler by herself, though, was not enough to overshadow her dark mood held over from the events of the previous night. Erica kept secret about Jim that her mother was dating, but she was careful to never be alone with him ever again. She never told her mother or her 14-year-old sister, Karen. Really? Kids, we gotta tell! Yep. One beautiful Saturday night, Wood borrowed his cousin Dave's custom van and invited Karen and her mother Brenda to go for a ride, leaving the two younger ones, Erica, the 11-year-old that he just, you know kissed her bum and scared the crap out of her. The three of them spent the afternoon driving around the foothills above Pocatello. Brenda invited Wood to a party at her friend's house that night. So later, they dropped Karen off at home, and he and Brenda went to this party. Wood 
ended up showing back at Karen's door, and he told her that her mama was really drunk and he needed her help to talk some sense into her. She was still dressed in the sweats that she wore to bed, so she got up and she jumped into the van with Wood. Karen, sitting in the passenger seat looking for the Holiday Inn that Wood thought her mother was at, he traveled towards the interstate then, but then Wood didn't stop. Instead, he turned around and headed back towards town. So he's kind of talking to himself, and he says, I think my friend must have taken your mama out to his house, Wood said in an attempt to explain his change of course. The van climbed a steep grade into the darkened hills as the city lights faded below them. He turned onto a narrow asphalt road, drove down a dirt road that led to a pasture. Wood pulled the van to the side and stopped. He switched off the lights and turned off the ignition. I thought his house was up this way. I guess I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere, he said to Karen. Karen looked at Wood with a puzzled expression when he grabbed her by the hair and drug her to the back of the van. Do what I'll tell you or I'm going to blow your effing head off. He threw her to the carpeted floor, pulled off her sweatpants and said, now we're going to F. When he was finished, he glared at Karen and said, I'm going to kill your mother if you ever tell anyone about this. Oh, my gosh. So Wood drove her back to town, dropped her off in front of the house. Like her younger sister, their mother would not learn of what Jim had done until much, much later, one day in June. Oh, that's so awful. Yes. It just reminds us that our kids believe adults Mm -hmm. and that they are scared Mm -hmm. and it's our job to protect them. Oh, golly. I know. And the fact that they wouldn't tell their mom, at least eventually she does find out. Here's a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But what those kids had to live with, the summer of 1993... Wood worked out a deal with his cousin Dave to trade his Ford Ranger pickup in for a 1984 Buick Century. For a nine-year-old car, it was pretty mechanically sound, and it looked pretty good, too. It had a dark brown vinyl roof over a tan body and chrome wire wheel covers with a narrow-banded white walls. Dave said the truck was about shot, so he paid Wood $500 for it, then turned around and sold Jim the car for $1,900. He ended up only paying Haggard $300 in all. You know, that's kind of how Dave Haggard makes some extra money by he buys and sells vehicles and he maybe works on them. He gets a good deal here and there. But within days of getting the Buick, Wood headed to Salt Lake City, Utah and walked into a Sizzler Steakhouse. Ah, I remember those. For some reason, I don't know if I ever ate at one, but I remember hearing about them. I went once. I went once. I remember yeah. them having really good rolls. But again, I love a bread. You know, eating out is my favorite thing in the world to do. He ordered a child's portion chicken dinner, and when he moved to the next register to pay, he pulled his silver twenty-two semi-automatic Jennings out and robbed the place of over $1,000, $1,050. Well, wait a minute. Um, yeah, that's yeah, he just ballsy. went to this restaurant. Yeah, mm-hmm. because there had to be more than one worker at the Sizzler. So. When he had taken all the money he could hold in one hand, he leisurely just strode down the hallway, and his routine was so smooth that there were other patrons there, there was other staff, nobody had any idea that a robbery had just taken place. Mm -hmm. Because remember, he doesn't like to work. He just wants to take someone else's money because it's so much easier. Wood left the steakhouse with money in hand and headed down to a seedier side of town known for its aggressive street walkers. He picked up a blonde in a tight miniskirt who said she had a motel room where they could go. She hopped in the car and started to give him directions when he floored it. And they sped out of town towards the Wasatch W-A-S-A-T-H. Yep. Mountain range. He warned the blonde to shut up by flashing his gun. He finds an isolated spot and pulls over. He forced the terrified woman to perform oral sex on him. Then he rapes her. When he was done, he pulls up his pants and says, Now show me how to get to that motel room you were talking about. Wood drops the woman off at the motel, tells her to turn around and walk away from the car and not to look back. She hurries off. In his usual way. Yep. She hurries off with her high heels clicking on the sidewalk. With a new big stack of cash, he offered to take his friend Liz, Tammy, and Martin out for dinner, his treat, to make up for missing Tammy's birthday. Typical Jim, Liz thought. Money one day, none the next. She just kind of shrugs it off. Wood paid the tab and even left the waitress a $30 tip. I know Tammy and Liz noticed, like, wow, he must be feeling good today. A few days later, Wood walked into Papa Paul's Cafe. From there, he ordered a nighttime omelet and coffee. The waitress noticed he had beer in his breath as she scribbled down his order. 
When Wood finished eating about 10 minutes later, he was the last one left. He paid the tab, and the manager had locked the door since it was half past closing time. So this man is just constantly thinking about how can I take advantage of this person or how can that person help me? Right. I need money. I want to have sex. I'm angry because I just thought about a woman. He's just a constant, constant He eats criminal. for free a lot, too. He sure does. When Wood finished eating about 10 minutes later, he was the last one left. He paid the tab, and the manager locked the door since it was half past closing time. Manager Matt Warren offered to walk him out when Wood produced a small silver pistol from his jogging pants. He ordered Matt to lock the door and to leave the keys in it. Wood pushed Matt backwards towards the cashier stand with a gun in his hand. He ordered the cashier to put all of the bills in a bag and demanded that Matt bring the rest of his staff out front. When everyone was in place, Wood ordered everyone to the office where he knew the safe most likely was. Then he told the cook to open it. The manager said, I can't open the office door. It was on the key ring that you made me leave in the front door. Well, shit, says that gunman. (laughs) Wood marched everyone back to the front of the restaurant and guided the manager by the back of his shirt to retrieve the keys. In single file, they returned to the office, demanded everyone to lie down on the floor and for Matt to open the office door. While Wood hogtied the cook with some rope he had in his pocket, Matt fiddled with the combination lock on his safe, repeatedly passing the numbers he needed because he was so nervous. At last, though, Matt got the safe open. While Wood had his back to him, he was tying up dishwasher's hands. Matt sprints through the open office door, jams the keys into the lock of the outside door, then bolts across the parking lot toward the lights of the Phillips 66 truck stop that was across the street. Oh, wow. In fact... Matt had escaped so quickly that more than a few seconds elapsed before Wood even realized he was gone. Without a word, the gunman made a dash for the front door and ran out into the night. Tuesday, June 29th, Jim Wood arrived for dinner a bit early to friend Liz Smith's house. Liz's daughter Tammy invited him over for a roast with mushroom gravy. She was going to make him dinner. As Wood sat on the sofa chatting with Liz's six-year-old granddaughter, the doorbell rings. Liz made her way to the front door, opens it, and then invites in this little newspaper carrier, Geralee Underwood, into the small foyer. Wood turned to look at her, and he smiles. So you've got your own paper out, huh? Yes, sir. Well, you must be a smart little girl. Why wouldn't it surprise me if you grew up to be president someday? Geralee looks at the man and rolls her eyes. She knows he's conning her or whatever. She's savvy. Liz, returning with a check, hands it to Jerry Lee, who says thank you, slips it into her canvas bank bag, and leaves through the chain link gate heading down towards the sidewalk. Suddenly, Wood stands up, says he has to run to the store for beer. Tammy yells at him from the kitchen to hurry back because dinner's going to be ready soon. Wood walks outside, looks toward the house where the little girl had just entered, then hurried to his Buick. He drove down the street that ran along the side of the house. He did a sharp U-turn, then parked on the opposite side of the street and waited. Geralee would have to walk directly in front of his car when she crossed the street. Soon, Geralee came out and said thank you as Blanche Tucker held out her hand and took the receipt from the little girl. Blanche watched Geralee as she bound down the sidewalk. Blanche returns to her living room and looks out her big picture window and she catches a glimpse of this little girl crossing the street. You know, everyone in the neighborhood is familiar with her, and they all kind of watch out for her because, you know, she's just 11. She notices that she is stopped by a man in a dark cap standing beside the open door of his car. She did not recognize him. Dark shadows were cast across the man's face by the overhanging elm trees, but she saw that Jerry Lee was talking to the man. She saw Jerry Lee unzip the canvas bank bag, hold out a piece of paper to the man, and then suddenly she just disappeared. In fact, it happened so quickly that Blanche wondered if she'd even seen it. She thinks she just witnessed an abduction. The man had pushed Jerry Lee into the car and sped off. Quickly, she rushed to the phone and she calls Joyce and Jeff Underwood, but the line was busy. She dials it again, still busy. Concerned that something terrible had just happened to Jerry Lee, Blanche calls Jeannie Johnson, who is a friend that lives in the same subdivision of the Underwoods, and explains to her quickly what she just saw. Asks that she run over to their house and tell the parents what she'd seen. Jeannie rushes out the door to the cul-de-sac and knocks on Underwood's door. Joyce had just hung up the phone when she opened the door. Jeannie explained to Joyce what Blanche had just told her. Then Joyce tries to remain calm as she dials Blanche. 
Blanche asked Joyce if Geralee had anyone helping her on her paper route today. Joyce says no, she didn't. Blanche goes on to tell her that she saw Geralee get into a car or maybe be pushed into a car that she's never seen before, and it looks like she didn't go willingly. Joyce knew it was not unusual for people who knew Geralee to see her near the end of her route to offer her a ride home, and maybe, you know, maybe that was the case, but something felt very wrong. Joyce runs to the back door, yells at her husband, Jeff, that something might have happened to Geralee. Jeff drops his gardening tools, heads to the back door where Joyce frantically explains to him what she was just told. So the two jump into Jeff's truck, rush through the neighborhood, scanning both sides of the streets, looking for any sign of their daughter. Jeff pulls the, into the little stinker convenience store to use their payphone. Stop right there. Yep, it's what it's called. Okay, so this convenience store is called the Little Stinker. Yep, I love it. Sure right. is. I Sorry, audience, had to stop her and just I know con- I had to confirm that. Keep from from giggling. Okay, so wait a minute. So they've jumped in their car. They're going out to look for her, but no <laughs> one's called the police yet. Nope, not okay. yet. Okay, all right, all right. Mm-hmm. Hey, everybody, take five seconds. Call the police. Yep. Well, it's easier now that we have cell phones. But he had to go find a phone because they went to Blanche's. They went driving around. Before I drove, though, I would have gotten my home phone and called the police. Yeah, (laughs) not not wrong. Jeff pulls into the little stinker convenience store to use the pay phone that is located on the outside of the building. With trembling hands, he dials 911 and tells the officer who took the call that his 11-year-old daughter had possibly been kidnapped. The officer could tell by the sound of the father's voice how serious the situation was. Within minutes of the call, officers met Joyce and Jeff Underwood in front of Blanche's house. Officers asked Blanche to describe the car, the color, what model it was. She says it was hard to tell exactly because the car was parked under the shade of a big tree. Yet she believed the car to be about the same size and shape as her neighbor's car, which was a 1987 Oldsmobile Cutlass. The man was white, she saw. He was clean-shaven clean-shaven, had a stocky build, and was between 30 and 40 years old. Yep, you guessed it. He shaved his mustache and his goatee. When asked if she could identify this man from a photograph, she told him it was unlikely because she couldn't see his face very clearly. She also said that although she saw Geralee being pushed into the vehicle, she didn't see her when the car drove away. Detectives immediately contacted the shift commander, Lieutenant George Housel. A description of the car, the driver, and Jerry Lee was radioed to every single officer on the street, as well as to the Bannock County Sheriff's Department and the local office of the Idaho State Police. Meanwhile, detectives Kappel and Kingsley know that their chances of finding Jerry Lee lessen with each passing minute. It's starting to get dark now. Driving separately, the detectives drive several miles south looking for turnoffs and isolated roads that would lead to areas of seclusion. They know that most abductors would go to the first secluded location that he can find and molest the child. South Arthur Street offers many such locations, so they drove over that area, scoured every single area that they could think of, and the detectives eventually returned to the city limits just after dark. One of the first calls Jeff Underwood makes when he and his wife Joyce return home is to an elder in their ward of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mormon wards usually consist of roughly 600 members. Within minutes of Jeff's call, an organization within his ward set up to deal with personal emergencies, and they go into action. The ward members and friends flood the Underwood home with love, support, and covered dishes of food. Search parties were formed and organized. Local regional media outlets were contacted, including the Idaho State Journal. The television stations in Pocatello and Idaho Falls and the alt radio stations broadcasting in southeastern Idaho. So they were on it. They were. And they have a, a church that is set up with for such emergencies. Can you you know, I have to say, I, I worked for um, a family that was Mormon and owned a business. And many employees were Mormon. And it, what I found about the Mormon church uh, is that... Um, They do have something I think was pretty unique and awesome is that Mm -hmm. everyone in the church has a job. So if you're maybe own a landscaping company, you're doing landscaping. If you're maybe a teacher, you're teaching, um, you know, Sunday school. Um, And then there's all these committees and everything. And I think a lot of church has have these, but there's something about the Mormon church that really 
uh, they take it very seriously. They're like a well-oiled machine. They are a really well-oiled machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the other churches could really take lessons from the fact that everyone in the church has a job. Yeah. And so, obviously, there's a whole group that's just on special emergencies. So you don't have to spend time delegating mm-hmm. who should do what. No. Nope. I mean, that is brilliant, really. Yeah. They really have their shit together. Yeah, they for do. For lack of better words. <laughs> a little shout out to Kurt and Karen. Yeah. Who's Kurt and Karen? Uh, they were the owners of this company that I worked with. And oh. They were Mormon, and they were the ones who taught me a lot about the religion and, and also helped me understand what wasn't the religion. Because when right. you hear Mormon, yeah. you often think many wives. And so yeah. they really taught me a lot about the religion and <laughs> um, and were just, you know, yeah. amazing good people. So uh, That's awesome. Yeah, I'm so. laughing because I immediately had a brain fade. I'm like, Kurt and Karen, okay, who is that? No, 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 not in the story. There, <laughs> no. Shout out to Kurt and Karen. I need to drink in, a little more caffeine in the or Phoenix champagne. Area, in the Phoenix area. Well, who, um, just unbelievable good, good humans. Yeah, That's absolutely. Awesome. We need more of those. Faxes were sent that described Jerry Lee and the clothing she was last seen in, as well as just a description of the vehicle that she was seen being pushed into. That evening, the first news of Jerry Lee's abduction was broadcast on the late local news by both TV stations, KPVI and KIDK, plus KIFI in Idaho Falls. A printing company owned by a quote-unquote brother ward member worked throughout the night printing thousands of posters, and by early the next morning, they began to distribute them throughout Pocatello and the surrounding region. Copies of these posters were faxed to all the truck stops west of the Missouri River. The headline read, missing in large caps, then had a large picture of Jerry Lee and a description of the suspect and his car. In the past 15 years, five young girls had been abducted and murdered in Pocatello. Oh, whoa. Mm-hmm. Only one of those cases were cleared, that of Lynette Don Culver. Serial killer Ted Bundy was responsible for her murder. He confessed more than a decade later, though her body has never been recovered. That leaves four unsolved murders, and like Jerry Lee, They were very young, ranging from 12 to 14 years of age. The headline read, Missing. A reward was offered for Geraldine's safe return. And that's the end of part two. Whoa. Yep. So, I'm assuming with the title, Geraldine, his last victim, we don't know whether she survives, lives, nothing. We know that maybe he gets caught. Or something happens to him because we say because that's we his have last this book victim. written. Right. So, and wow, Annie. This yeah. is overwhelming. Just to think of that there are evil people out there mm-hmm. that are like this. Yeah. And um, I know it. I just can't imagine my child being being gone and not knowing what's happening to them. It's it's every it is every parent's worst nightmare. It is the worst nightmare. And unfortunately there are so many, so many people out there that have had to go through such this such a horrible ordeal. Absolutely. My heart goes out to everyone who's ever had to deal with anything even remotely. It's the worst. Similar. I think John Walsh, who, um, for those who aren't familiar, John Walsh is, you know... Um, America's most wanted. Yeah, those. But really, John Walsh, what people many times I don't think realize is that I remember it. I was in third grade and um, Mm -hmm. he, his little boy Adam was kidnapped and killed and then found, but this case wasn't solved till almost 27 years later. Keep in mind, this was back when I was just a little girl. So I remember how impressionable it was. And then we had a friend named Grace who moved there from that Florida area. So Mm -hmm. right that time. So it was very impressionable. Bottom line is, John Walsh um, says that the worst club to belong to is this club. Mm -hmm. Either your child's missing or has been killed. So... Annie, this makes me very nervous for what's going to happen to Jerry Lee, and I'm hoping something justice is served for James Wood, but we'll see. You're going to find out. All right. Well, in the meantime, right. audience, once again, we thank you for listening. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
again so much for joining us, everyone. Be sure to stay connected with us on social media at both Instagram and Facebook. Our Instagram is Heroes Zeros Podcast and Facebook Heroes and Zeros, a true crime podcast. And you can listen to our podcast episodes or support or donate money to us. And you can send us your stories and just a lot more at our website, which is Heroes and Zeros True Crime. Dot com. Again, that's heroes and zeros true crime.com. And you can email us also at heroes to zeros and more. That's the number two heroes to zeros and more at gmail.com. Exactly. And you can also support us at our Patreon site now, which is patreon.com slash heroes zeros. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.